Just like uh, Robert, I'm going to take a little bit of latitude. For those of you that have never come across Snorco and uh, know very little about us, I thought I would actually tell you a little bit about us before we actually start. So Norco was established in 1895 uh, and uh, has about 290 shareholders and 175 to 180 uh, supplying farms. So that's actually changing as we speak due to the uh, negotiations. We're actually bringing on new farmers to service the Coles contract in June. We uh, fundamentally um, manufacture uh, dairy product uh, for the fresh milk market, the ice cream market, yogurts, and we also have a rural retailing business that actually represents about a, a third of our business. So we, we've been a, a business that's maintained its diversity. So in the uh, 80s and 90s, many organisations actually chose to uh, move into uh, one business stream. We've actually managed to actually keep that, uh, that process in place and have used that as a proposition to talk to our customers, which I'm going to talk about. So just to give you a sense of um, some of our products, just to make sure that if you ever need some, you need some. Uh, so obviously yeah, I won't go through those. Um, and on the ice cream side, so the fresh milk business is our branded business. Uh, and then in the ice cream manufacture, we actually take, we have a philosophy in our business which actually uh, works about that we take every litre of your milk from our farmers and we get the best value you possibly can, unlike uh, some other organisations that have chosen to do, uh, take a different path. So, uh, and the manufacture of ice cream is uh, fundamentally different to the manufacture of our uh, Brenda product. It is completely contract manufactured. So that we actually, man we, we've had a long-standing relationship with um, a, a number of retailers over many years. And the catalyst for us to have a uh, deeper relationship with Coles more recently was the fact that we were, um, had, have been manufacturing a number of their um, uh, generic style lines or even upper end brands for many years. So, it's, so we've had a multi-stream business in that respect. But my subject today is really talking about cooperatives working with uh, the retailers. And uh, what's actually allowed us to do it? Because um, Norco's history, you'd you think um, a, a business that's been around as long as we have, we'd uh, be much larger than we have. Historically, Norco was confined by the, um, this might sound odd for a chairman of a cooperative to actually say this, but historically Norco was bound by the regulation system. We operated in northern New South Wales and we had distinct boundaries that we could op operate within. So when, that, when regulation was uh, taken away in 2000, we um, had been in, we'd already um, taken into a, a number of arrangements with and joint ventures in fresh milk. And that was pr predominantly to actually undertake a program with the retailers. We needed to have an east coast distribution channel. And when I say that, uh, if, and the, um, we needed to supply Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane and Cairns and uh, to some degree um, Adelaide. If you didn't do that, if you couldn't do that, you didn't get an option to tender for product. And that continued for around 15 years. Uh, so that program had a significant impact upon the retailers and it was all driven about unit price. So when um, the, uh, the opportunity came for us to actually talk to uh, business, uh, the, the major retailers and start to engage with them about our diversity of business and our real interest about our real interest in is our farmers. We operate a cooperative, and we're not ashamed to actually say, just like Murray Goulburn, our interest is, in, is making sure they get the best milk price we can possibly uh, put in their pocket with a reasonable dividend. Um, that, that's a complete different model to um, many other corporate organisations. Theirs is about shareholder returns, ours is about milk price, and we don't lose that thought. So, so. For, from a retail perspective, we need to be able to convince retailers that we can manage all the issues. We're, we're, we're not actually an organisation that it, uh, has poor corporate governance. We don't fight, in, uh, there are no public brawls, there are no um, factions within our boards and with our memberships. We actually need to make sure that, from a governance perspective, that we're a stable organisation that are applying ourselves to best practice in governance. Uh, then we also need to make sure that we invest in our capital. The retailer's major concern is cooperatives historically have been very, very poor at investing in, investing in capital. They put all the money into milk price and then actually forget about investing in, in facilities. And we've actually had a good history and a good track record which we could actually demonstrate. So ultimately our success in putting a deal not only with Coles but any retailer is about, in fact, actually making sure that we over deliver on their expectation. It's nothing less than that. To give you a sense of uh, what the, just make sure, uh, give, to give you a sense of what the opportunity for an organisation to fill their factories and how that can actually um, affect a, a profitability of an organisation. If you look at these charts, the, uh, the, the, the one on your left uh, is actually telling you about the, 
um, the opportunity will move to 57% 50, of our business in generic and we've come from 41%. Now that actually basically fills our two factories, one based at Labrador and one based at Raleigh near Coffs Harbour. And now running those factories um, at, the, at a higher level with our own branded products still going through them allows us to share the increased uh, incremental return that we actually receive on those products back with the farm sector. And that's exactly what the retail market's actually looking for, moving, moving away from the... Um, that the current process of it's not just price, it's about making sure that they actually are seen to be uh, looking after the farm sector. So what's different about Norco? It's, it's about our uh, milk price and our members. Uh, the commo we're, we're extremely commercial and, and I know that may sound odd to uh, sound but there have been a lot of properties in, in the past um, 100 years that have actually failed purely because they don't actually act in a commercial way and I know uh, my board sometimes will actually give me a hard time, our shareholders give me a hard time sometimes because we do take a commercial line. It's finding that balance between commerciality and actually doing the right thing by your members. We operate across the whole supply chain and one of the things that we found really interesting is uh, and it's not, and I, I say this not only about domestic, but uh, our export market is being able to tell a consumer and being able to sit in a room and have a conversation about the supply of your ingredients through your rural re retail network and into the farm sector and manufacturing the product and putting it into the retail channel is a significant proposition that not many people can actually follow on. And it doesn't miss, and I just need to let you know that our rural retail business is, is only 10, our farmers, our dairy farmers are only 10% of that business. But the fact is we can actually engage with, our with the retail customers on a global scale about all the things we do along the chain. So in internally, and, 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 second, and finally on this one, is that it's really important that we have some internal programs to foster the relationships with our farmers. So whilst we're, we're commercial, we have many things that are going on internally in our business that we're very, very proud of, and I won't go through them. But the real issue, the, one of the, um, and I even checked this word out, that whether what's the rule, is it providence, is it provenance, uh, how do you actually explain it? But there's this growing trend across Australia and across the globe about where your food comes from, how far it travels, what programs it's gone through, what, uh, how the animals are being looked after. Can we, can we trace the product back to um, the, final, uh, the final farm if we need to? It's, it's those things that the, not only Australian retailers are looking for, it's the, the things that actually the global um, retailers are actually looking for. And we have absolute confidence that we can actually do that. The systems that, and, and I say this about Australia, but I, I say this more about New South, New South Wales and Queensland, ironically, the system that New South Wales and Queensland put into place back in the, uh, started in the late 80s and in the early 90s about quality assurance, about trying to keep the milk from Victoria out of New South Wales. And I, and I say that uh, somewhat flippantly, but that was the reality. We put quality assurance programs in place that are second to none across the globe. And, the, and what we so what we do is engage, and we are very, very um, pleased to actually uh, take our retailers through it. And only recently I actually sat down with a, a major retailer and actually showed them how, how it works and how the internal audit process and how the external audit process is undertaken to make sure that our farmers are doing the right things so that we can actually stand behind what we actually say. And that's the, that's the number one piece as a, as a smaller business where we need to find that proposition in the marketplace that people need to work for. We don't need to supply every, every customer what we need, to, every customer across the globe. We need to pick the ones that we want to work with that actually respect us. So, and, and, the, and I think the, the piece that I find really interesting, because me and my wife have a little bit of a, a, a chuckle about this and occasionally I do go shopping from time to time, but I think the thing that uh, is really interesting is the, um, the retailers have got really sophisticated about how they track what we actually do as customers. And the fact that is the moment you hand over your card to actually uh, pay for your goods and use your, um, whatever that card is my wife uses, which I refuse to have, uh, tells them exactly my shopping habits for, for a history of time. And people just don't understand that you give that information away, it's a, it's a flybase card, it actually gives them information, but they are tracking it and they are using that information. And that information has clearly told them that what we're actually looking, what we're actually proposing, is exactly what they're actually looking for. So to give you a couple of photos, um, I was very cautious about what I picked here. Oh, sorry if I've gone one too far. No, I haven't gone far enough. Sorry, I've been, I haven't been watching the slide. So, sorry about that. So on the on the right here, on the left here, you have uh, Curtis Stone. Uh, Curtis was, is with the farmers and I expect at some point in time um, it'll be the Murray Goldman or Norco. Someone is going to have a photo and there'll be a real squabbler I'm sure about who it's going to be. 
but it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day is the consumers, and if you listen to those ads, and there's a whole range of them, there's even one with Curtis Stone actually on a, leaning on a gate and talking about the farmers set in a, in a shop, and it actually looks like they're on a farm. The interest from the retailers about how they can prove to the consumers that they actually have a direct relationship with the farmers has completely changed. In the 80s and the 90s and, and 2000, it was about price, price, price. We, just tell us your best price. Don't tell us about anything else. We just want the price. It has changed, and can your shopping habits actually have changed that? On the right, we've got our, one of our farmers, and we've got a local, and I won't play it today, but we've got a local farmer called Ken's Wadsworth who actually uh, farms at um, Kurabel. I'd say it's one of the best places in Australia. Kurabel uh, overlooks Byron Bay, and it actually the lighthouse actually swings past his farm. Uh, just an amazing piece. One of his farm is one of the original farms that uh, started supplying Norco in 1895. So what's the, what's the benefit of actually supplying a major retailer? And and there are really significant benefits in Australia. There is it's about access to channel to market. You can't ignore the three big Aldi, Woolworths, and Coles. You just can't ignore them. To do that, you're doing that at your peril. But what we do is that we've actually made the proposition that we're more than happy to actually share the, the margin and the benefits that we actually um, take and actually demonstrate that transparently back to the, uh, the, um, the retailers. We've, uh, we, we've had conversations with the retailers about value adding. So when we've actually got surplus milk from time to time, we've actually gone back to them and said, look, we've actually got some opportunities. We actually are very keen to actually share them with you and then actually share those rewards with our members. And we've actually done that. And in fact, in a, more recently, we actually released a, a price increase across our, our members for a six month period of one cent a litre due to that fact that the retailers had actually um, helped us do that. We don't have our own brands in, in our manufactured products, so that actually helps us to some degree. Um, we, we, means that we don't necessarily uh, have that, especially in the manufacture of ice creams and yogurts, we don't have that um, affiliation that we have to support our brands. We can actually do things that others want. And just to give you an example, the way it works in the ice cream business, we do the whole gamut of it. We can actually, we have an R&D team, we have um, the manufacturer and we have the logistics. We, do, we basically, you come with a proposition, we'll actually make it for you and we'll find it and we'll actually test it in the market for you, which, that, which you need to pay for, but we can do that whole lot. And that's actually uh, working really well for us. But one of the things I think is really important that, and I say this about suppliers and it's about our farmers, I, should, I could have actually said our farmers, but the, if our farmers need to be educated about what are the, um, the expectations of the retailers. And just on the reverse of that, the previous point, it's about we need to educate the retailers on us the farmers and what's actually occurring at farm. So there's a two-way two uh, street and uh, we found that to be incredibly rewarding. Sitting around a room and actually having that uh, conversation is very, uh, very interesting. But again, it's about um, the fact that we need to find those balances between milk price, reinvestment and reward for your capital in the business. And ultimately, uh, just as Murray Goldman do, your profits that you, we create um, through manufacturing and distribution of product in Australia uh, actually stay in Australia. And it's not to say, and I say that very cautiously because it's not to say that a foreign um, company that's invested in a, uh, at Australia is, it's wrong. It's not, it's, it is, uh, that's great, we actually need investment in Australia, but our proposition is, we shouldn't be embarrassed, our proposition is, um, support us please. Now one of the things that I think, I, was, I, I want to take a little bit of latitude with this, is that one of the things I think about when I was given this topic on presentation was, people actually just assume that we have to operate in the domestic market. And, one of the, and these next two slides, and I was very pleased to actually see that there was, and I can actually update my slides, is that the next two slides actually talk about what's going on on the global scale. And this first one's about, uh, as we saw this morning, about the income growth. And this is an older uh, slide, but it's been repeated. This was created uh, by Rabobank back in about 2004, 2005. And it just tells you that in, as income grows, so does the change in your food and what you're actually spending it on. Meat and dairy are the ones that are actually going to um, be the benefits from this perspective. But the next one's about, I find this really, really interesting. The next one's about, everyone talks about we've got all this huge global, global uh, opportunity for dairy and agriculture. But unless we get productivity gains from the existing land, we're in real trouble, in my view. There is a real, as just as we've seen the retailers change their, um, their buying habits, at some point in the near future, I would suggest there's going to be real changes in how we actually either get product, productivity gains or who's going to miss out. Because as the population grows, there's not enough food. And it's coming. It's just a matter of when it's going to happen. And we might, we might keep it off for a little while, but it's coming. And more importantly, I'm going to talk about this as we go. I'm not going to, the next couple of slides are going to miss some, miss some but I'm going to go down to the, um, 
uh, second last stop point. It's about volatility. Volatility in not only um, uh, milk uh, in your commodity prices, but volatility in, your, in how we actually manage droughts, floods and things like that. And one of the reasons that we had a really good conversation with some retailers back in um, 2009 flood in Brisbane was, in, not, in, in, those, in that year, in that flood in January 2009, I think it was 2009, they could, you could go to McDonald's, you could get a burger and you get a piece of meat. You couldn't get the tomato, you couldn't get the lettuce and you couldn't get the sauce because of the way we've created a system. Now, uh, that was the first time, that, to my knowledge, that McDonald's actually suffered that, that consequence. And it was a really interesting one. And, when you were, and all the retailers, everyone knew about it, but the fact was for a short period of time, it wasn't very long, but you could not get what you were used to. And boy, does that create a problem. It's the same with milk. You couldn't actually get milk either at a point. So what we need to start talking about and what we need to start thinking about is how, as businesses, are we going to actually manage those critical periods of volatility? Because today we can actually see that things aren't too bad, but at a point in time there will be the volatility and we've got enough to actually manage, but how are we going to actually manage those issues of who gets the product and who does not get the product? And that gets me to the point about relationships. It's how you're actually honest about it. So one of the things that we've done um, across the, uh, our, not only our domestic business, but our expert businesses, we've actually built relationships, not just with an individual, but with organisations. It's really important for us to actually do that. And we've had some uh, historical periods where someone leaves in the business and the relationships with an individual. We've made sure that the, our businesses are actually, our relationships are actually structured two or three levels in the business. We've moved to a point of actually, uh, as you would know all the retailers, we've uh, heard Murray Golden signed a 10-year deal with uh, uh, Coles. We've signed a five-year deal. It's interesting to know, um, a number of years ago, you would have lucky to get a 12-month, a 6-month, a 12-month contract with retailers. So now talking three, five and 10 years. That gives you the message that there is a sh uh, uh, an issue of supply and they're looking to actually shore up that product. So what we do is that we lead by example, just because someone actually um, treats us poorly doesn't mean to say that we actually have a, um, we, we, it's, it's fine to be uh, strong in your views, but we have to respect, that, uh, respect those. But most importantly, it's, it's also good as, a, as, you, as the retailers and, the, and this globalisation piece, piece continues to evolve, and I grew up through school when everyone started talking about globalisation and we didn't really know about it, and Paul Keating was talking about playing, uh, equal playing field. Well, Globalisation is happening, happening, but the equal playing field has never happened. It's never going to happen, in my view. And I understand why. But the fact is that we need to foster, not only foster long-term relationships, we need to find new relationships and continuing to build on them. And that's where the Asian opportunity actually comes in, and that's what we need to actually put our energy into. But, you know, most importantly, the day that... The, and we had a recent experience where we felt so... I felt so passionate about a particular issue that we went back to a retailer and said, what you're doing is absolutely wrong. And the fact that they actually listened to us, against my management's advice, but anyway. But sometimes you need to be brutally honest with them and actually be upfront about where the position is in a respectful way. And I think they're, they're, that's the change that I'm seeing in the, global, in, in the, in the domestic market. And um, I actually expect it was actually coming into the global market. But to, uh, without banging on all day, all day about cooperatives and uh, their opportunities, I think that the challenge is for us to actually sustain our momentum. We had International Year of Cooperative last year. People actually started to get it that uh, cooperatives can actually be run as uh, viable businesses. They are uh, reasonable structures to actually have. We need to be commercially focused. There's no ifs, buts or anything else on it. We need to be commercially focused and to survive we have to be. But on that side of it, we need to adhere to our, our purpose. Our purpose is our milk price, paying a reasonable dividend and making sure there's a future in dairy. No farmer wants the best price today and a lousy price tomorrow. They're looking for that uh, nice trend in upward pricing. Uh, and I think that the, the piece that we've um, put a lot of energy is, is trying to find, as um, our retailers are becoming uh, more concentrated in Australia and the fact that we're, um, we're, we're finding ourselves as generally an alliance, you'll find yourself with more business with one than the other that we need to find alternative markets to actually make sure that we're not controlled by a retailer uh, in, in, in any particular way. So we've got a real eff, uh, emphasis on that and I can actually um, successfully say that we're actually now putting fresh milk product into uh, the Philippines as of last week and we're also now putting um, trialling product into China. So there are significant opportunities and we're actually doing those because people see our proposition as something that re really adds value. 
And ultimately, we have to take our members from uh, forward with us and our stakeholders. Just as uh, Robert Poole actually said earlier, um, how we find that additional uh, milk to supply the opportunity we have into Asia for the benefit of Australians, I think is a real challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you.